Greetings and welcome to the course FL30403, Plant Genetics and Breeding. I'm your instructor, Associate Professor Dr. Kenneth Francis Rodriguez, and I will be teaching this course along with your course coordinator, Dr. Mandy Maid, and my colleague, Associate Professor Dr. Wilson Yong Thao Lim. Now, plant genetics and breeding is a very fascinating subject and our knowledge of plant genetics and breeding is evolving. We are still in the process of learning new information as we sequence more genomes and get a higher resolution of the genetic diversity. However, with the existing knowledge that we have, we can still conduct breeding experiments and this is what will be covered in this particular course. Now, as a student, you will be encountering a lot of new terms in breeding. So please pay attention to specific terminologies. We will be learning, for instance, about inbreeding, outbreeding, pleiotropy, land races. These are all new terms which you may have not encountered before, but I will make every effort to introduce you to these terms and contextualize them with appropriate examples. This is what you are expected to learn from this particular course. The first one is you need to have a fundamental knowledge of plant genetics and breeding concepts. Second element is the ethical element and professional conduct. This involves, for instance, ethics related to genetic engineering and plant biotechnology. And the third one is your ability to use critical thinking and problem solving skills to resolve certain breeding experiments and experimental designs. This is the assessment. So your assignment will carry 20 marks. Laboratory and field reports carry 40 marks. Quizzes carry 10 marks and your final test will comprise 30 marks for a total of 100 marks. Let us begin with delving into the process of breeding in a natural forest. If you look at a natural forest, just by looking at it, you will realize that there is diversity. And this diversity may be at the level of a species or it may be a diversity which is entirely related to a single tree species. So we have different levels of what are termed as interspecific and intraspecific diversity. But when you look at a natural forest, there's a process going on. That process has been continuing for millions or maybe billions of years as trees evolve without any human intervention. This is a natural process. However, when we look at the interventions by human beings, to improve crops and trees, we essentially are looking at the application of breeding to commercial enterprise. This means that we try to exploit nature in order to develop innovations which can be applied for our benefit. Now, if you look at the history of breeding from the early days, the first Breeding obviously focused on what is essential for human survival and that was crop. Crops such as corn, rice, tomatoes, potatoes, they were all bred by different civilizations. We have what are known as the Vavilov centers of diversity. So the Russian scientist or Russian botanist Vavilov described these centers as the origin of new crops. For instance, South America is the origin of wheat varieties as well as the modern corn varieties. Then we have the Japonica and the Indica cultivars of rice which were derived from Southeast Asia, from India, Indochina and Japan. So these are the various centers of diversity where humans first made interventions to develop new varieties of crops. Now we translate this into agroforestry. Now forest products are essential for economic 
growth and economic development. So this science of breeding has been translated into applications to breeding of forestry species. And in general, when we breed any kind of crop for a commercial use, what is important is consistency. For instance, you can see the diversity of logs in this particular picture. Now, all of these logs cannot be milled very easily because the saw and the milling machinery may want only one type or one dimension of logs. So when breeders breed uh, trees for commercial applications, they have to look at the size, the girth size, the type of wood quality, the consistency is what is important. And this is what breeding aims to do. Now, in order to understand breeding, you have to begin by understanding the fundamentals. What are the fundamentals of breeding? How do you carry out, for instance, hybridization, interspecific or intraspecific hybridization? What are the limitations that you will encounter? What are the possible experimental designs that you can apply to carry out this breeding experiment? I will delve into the content of the lectures by summarizing each lecture within a single slide. Now, the first thing which you will learn is mitosis and meiosis. This is a very fundamental element of knowledge. And you have to understand this process in order to understand, for instance, segregation of chromosomes during meiosis and mitosis, as well as the process of recombination and linkage. These are terms which you will utilize during the process of breeding. Our earliest recollection of breeding commences with Mendelian genetics. Now, Gregor Mendel is the first researcher or the first scientist who began to describe the process of phenotypes and genotypes in terms of modern science. Of course, that does not mean there was no attempt to breed plants before. Three to five thousand years ago, humanity was still breeding, for instance, corn, which was derived from teosinte, wheat, rice, all the vegetables and crops which we eat today were derived by breeding, which was conducted thousands of years ago. However, that has not been recorded in history. We do not have the scientific records for that. This is why we begin with Mendelian genetics as a starting point. Now, Mendel carried out very simple experiments purely based on phenotype, which means the external characteristics or the visible characteristics of a plant. He had no knowledge of genetics. However, by carrying out these experiments, he was able to define the terms such as alleles and recessive and dominant. We will look into that element of breeding when we study Mendelian genetics. Now, not all things can be explained by Mendelian genetics. And again, that is an indication of the limitation of our knowledge. There are various other processes which take place within the genome, such as dominance and recessive alleles. Okay, so we have dominant alleles, recessive alleles. We also have lethal alleles. If we cross these plants together or these varieties together, you will have basically no progeny. So these are lethal alleles. There's also the ph phenomenon of epistasis and there are environmental effects. So all of these effects or these factors play into the process of gene regulation and gene inheritance, which in turn gives you the final product. Plants have been bred for thousands of years and what we are consuming today as food resources has been developed over thousands of years of breeding. And this breeding essentially involved a human intervention because at some point in time, humans must have realized that they cannot subsist on natural products or natural resources. So then they attempted to breed plants. And what is important to know when breeding plants is that they have very short life cycles. For instance, a tomato plant, you can obtain the seeds within 60 to 90 days of planting the seedlings. However, in the case of forest trees, 
maturity may only be attained after seven to eight years. So now this life cycle plays a very important role when you are conducting breeding experiments or developing new varieties of plants. We also have what are known as exotic species, which are imported varieties and endemic species and naturally occurring what are known as provenance species. When we do a plant breeding experiment, we have to select the original parental genotypes based on the characteristics. And this is another element of breeding which you should be aware of. Breeding essentially in involves a keen observation of the parental genotypes and phenotypes from which we develop what are known as the pedigreed and the elite lines. Now in plant breeding, there are multiple methods. You can develop a isogenic line. You can bulk plants, which means you can combine various plants by using pedigreed met methods and bulk breeding methods. This has to be done in an organized method or organized structure. For example, we have a process known as pyramiding, which enables us to combine various traits from different varieties to obtain uh, elite line which contains all the traits. We will be learning about all this during the course of the lecture on plant breeding methods. There is also something known as plant back crossing which enables you to retain the traits of the original parental genotype when it is crossed with a wild type. So back crossing is another very important element of plant breeding. Now breeding methods can also involve outbreeding, selection of plant based on mass selection and we have what are known as recurrent selection methods. Okay, we can also develop interspecific hybrids provided that the pollen grains can be exchanged. So we can do that. However, there are limitations which we will discuss. What do you see in the picture alongside is uh, inflorescence which has been covered with a bag. Now these bags are specifically designed so that there is no interchange of pollen and all the pollination occurs as self-pollination. Okay, this is another technique which you will learn during the course of this lectures. Now there are certain barriers to hybridization between species. For instance, you cannot cross certain species primarily because the ploidy or the number of chromosomes may be different. So the, during the process of recombination, there will be certain issues involved with the crossover and homologous recombination. There can also be, for instance, physical barriers. Certain plants may not be, have the ability to uptake pollen from other varieties. But what essentially breeders are looking for is something known as heterosis or hybrid vigor. We base everything on the assumption that when we outbreed or crossbreed, there will be a improved variety of genetic material. But this may not always be the case because other factors, as I mentioned earlier, lethal alleles can cause problems for breeders and limit the ability to, cro uh, to cross over between species. One of the important types of breeding is mutation breeding. In this case, we use a chemical modification of the DNA to induce a mutation in specific genes and cause a change in the variety. This can also be done using radiological methods, in which case ionizing radiation can be utilized to modify the genome. Now, when we speak about mutation breeding practically, the issue of stability of mutation comes into play because not all mutations will be retained. They may be lost even over the lifetime of a plant. The purpose of doing this mutation breeding is to select those mutants which have the traits which we desire. Now, when we come down to recording the scientific aspects of breeding, we have to quantify the different elements of breeding. And this is where quantitative genetics comes into play. For instance, we have discrete traits and continuous traits. Discrete traits are very distinct. For instance, a plant will only have flowers which are red or white. 
when we speak of continuous traits, we speak of traits which are everything in between red and white. For example, you'll have red, white, you'll have pink and magenta. Now, obviously, this particular interaction between colors is caused because of the co-dominance of alleles or maybe the dominance of one particular allele. And these are factors which we can evaluate using quantitative genetics. Now, because of the large number of genes, for instance, 20 to 30,000 genes within a specific genome, we cannot obtain a very precise picture of what is happening within the process of breeding. However, quantitative genetics gives us some idea of what we will obtain when we carry out, for example, a hybrid cross. Now, as a forest tree breeder or as a breeder of forest species, one of the important things to note is that we need to select plants based on specific genetic elements. Now, when you look at a species or you look at a species in a forest, which is a monoculture or single type, it's very difficult to differentiate between different kinds of varieties or cultivars purely by observation. So we need to look deeper and this is where population genetics come in. We look at the diversity of alleles and we look at heterozygosity as a definition of the diversity of a population. So in population genetics, we will study the different kinds of traits, the experimental design and the manner in which you can sample natural populations to the best of our ability. Plant biotechnology has revolutionized the way we breed plants. Today, it's no longer necessary for us to cross over, for instance, two plants to obtain a third plant. We can actually do what is known as clonal reproduction via tissue culture. This involves isolation of tissue, and then the genes can be introduced directly into that tissue by using different methods such as biolistics. And once the gene is introduced, we can screen for the presence or absence of that gene, and we can develop genetically engineered species. Now, this process of genetic engineering is very complex. However, what underlies the process is the ethics involved with genetics and breeding. Do we as a species have the right to modify an existing living species? This is an ethical issue. In Malaysia, this is also an issue because modification or genetic modification of plants by external interventions such as the introduction of DNA has to comply with the National Biodiversity Acts and laws. So these are factors which you need to consider when you attempt to breed new varieties of trees for commercial use. It is permitted, however, you need to look at the ethical and other considerations such as the legal considerations before you intervene into plant biotechnology. With that, I would like to thank you for listening to this introduction. We will commence with our first lecture online. I have posted the link in the Smart V3 system. So you'll have a link there, which is a WebEx link or a Microsoft Teams link. You can view the lecture on this link when I deliver the synchronous lecture. However, if you have any problems with the recording of the lecture or viewing the lecture, I will create a video for you and I will upload it in the same week after the lecture is complete. So in that way, you can still access the lecture. However, please ensure that you attend the lecture by clicking on the attendance link. Thank you very much, and I look forward to interacting with you. Stay safe.